the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The text is the Gospel which you heard read from Luke chapter 18, and I suppose also that Old Testament reading from Isaiah 35. To the world, honestly, we're kind of nobodies. We're relegated to the sidelines in our country's mind, I suppose, here in Grand Rapids, we're in flyover country. Perhaps in your life there have been those who have pushed you away, tried to silence you, maybe even to silence your confession of Jesus. You probably don't have a certain seat with the cool kids at school. And I'm not sure cool is the right word anymore, but I'm old. <laughs> we're not the brightest and best, perhaps, and we haven't lived up to that divine love that we're called to, that keeps no record of wrongs, that bears all things, that is long-suffering and all is kind, that is not arrogant or boastful or seeking our own way. Oh, how we all want to be in charge and push others out of the way. But being nobodies, sitting by the side of the way, we're actually in a most blessed place. We're sitting here with a blind man. St. Mark, in his account of today's gospel, lets us know, a bit ironically perhaps, that this blind man's dad's name is Timaeus. It means honor. And his name is Bartimaeus, which means son of honor. But really, he's dishonored shoved off to the side of the road, a blind beggar. And especially when he learns that Jesus is passing by and he cries out for mercy to the son of David, the promised Messiah. Well, then the crowd tries to hush him up. You're not important. Be quiet. And it's not just the crowd that's missing it. While the blind man gets who Jesus is, the very promised Messiah, the hand-picked twelve, cannot see it. Jesus has just told the twelve his third clear prediction of his passion. He said, behold, see, look, but it was hidden from their eyes. Jesus knows where he's going. He's on the way to shame, rejection, seeming failure, to win eternal life by his death and resurrection on the third day. He'll be betrayed by his own people and handed over to the Gentiles, he tells us. He'll be mocked and shamed and spit on, then flogged and killed. I'm guessing there's not one of us here who would choose such a route, the route of being mocked and shamed and spit on, much less being flogged and killed. But your Jesus picks it. He's determined. He will not relent. His love is not for himself. It is for his Father who sent him and for you. You're the very apple of his eye. He goes all the way to save you through the most difficult path featuring shame, dishonor, rejection, even to have the Father turn away from him, something that will never happen to you as you remain in him. I mentioned this a week ago Saturday. I, I love the hundred-year-old stained glass windows at a remote retreat center that doxology uses. There in the transepts of the church, sides, there's these two giant stained glass windows in those positions of, oh, I think second highest honor in the building. And in those stained glass windows, on the one side, Jesus is blessing the children, as we just sang in the hymn. He's blessing the children with a strong yet gentle word, even as the disciples are trying to shoo the kids away and keep the kiddos away from our Lord. Children in Jesus' day had no standing. And on the other transept, in that other window, is Jesus with the blind, and the poor, and the lame, and the dead, and the dying, and the mourning. 
Again, nobody's in the ancient world. The, that world didn't, could care less. They did not have the things we have now. Their weak and failing bodies were not honored with stunning medical centers and spacious, clean hospital rooms and wonderful doctors. You see, the Christian church following Jesus' lead has changed our world. Children now, except perhaps our unborn brothers and sisters, are honored. The sick ones are cared for. But Jesus was the one who changed things. He was with the nobodies, with the outcasts. He honored them, blessing them, and healing them, and touching them. And so today, he honors you, who also have been crying out to him for mercy. A blind beggar, away from the action of the busy, important world, crying out to Jesus for mercy. That's a perfect picture of faithful Christians. We have nothing to give him because, well, to cause him to love us, to care for us, to save us. We're, we're beggars, after all. Apart from him opening our eyes, we wouldn't know who he is. If it weren't for the work of the Holy Spirit, because we cannot see him or grasp hold of him, we would never know the eternal gift he is to us. So crying for mercy to Jesus is the most fitting prayer of all. It confesses that he is indeed our merciful Savior, and it asks him to give us what he knows is best, trusting that he wants exactly what is best for us. And that is proven by the fact he paid the ultimate price to get you. Make no mistake about it. Jesus was shamed and crucified and rose to honor you, to honor you with his unfailing love. Now all this happens on the outskirts of Jericho, which is close to the Dead Sea. It's about 825 feet below sea level. It's arid, hot, and oppressive there, but Jericho, is an oasis. There, there's fresh water, there's life, there's community. But there are outsiders, like Bartimaeus, and like that little guy who was hated by everybody named Zacchaeus. Jesus finds them both, and then he heads his way up, uphill 3,300 feet to Jerusalem through arid, parched, dangerous land. Your Jesus goes the full way to fulfill the promises of God and to find you through his death and resurrection to save you. He comes all this way into this little gathering here today off a frenzied street where they drive way over the speed limit to care for us, to hear our cries for mercy, to release our sins, to cleanse from us the shame and scars of a brutal world where mindless, angry men shoot at others and kill them and harm them. A brutal world. From it, we're cleansed and healed by our Jesus. We're beggars gathered as honest, get honored guests at the Son of David's table. Of course, uh, uh, here on the cusp of Lent, we're really on the same way with Bartimaeus, who followed Jesus on the way. He'll, he'll go with Jesus up to Jerusalem. He'll see his Savior lay down his life for him on the cross. He'll see the resurrected Jesus. He'll know without a doubt that he has a place at Jesus' eternal table. And here on the cusp of Lent, we know the same thing. We're really on the same road, following Jesus, watching him lead to Jerusalem to lay down his life for us and for all. And then we'll see him as he is today, resurrected, victorious, welcoming us to his table now and forever. Then it was in Jericho, now it's in Grand Rapids, 
the Holy Spirit's prophetic word through Isaiah speaks with such clarity, joy, and hope to you. Listen. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Oh, yes, he will come with vengeance against sin, against death, against Satan, against blindness and pain. They will reign no more. They will be stopped, all of them. He will come with the recompense of God. He will come and save you, Isaiah continues. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. And the highway shall be there, Isaiah continues, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Beloved of the Lord, come on this way because it belongs to you, for it's your Jesus who leads you. Be forgiven, be strengthened, be released from anxiety and fear, shame and guilt. Here in this arid land and time are pools of the water of life. Here in a time of endless anger, offense, violence and disappointment, is joy and dancing on a way to a feast that will never end. O oh, repentant Christian, see clearly. You are loved. You are honored. You are saved by the Son of God, the Son of David, who chose to be mocked, spit upon, and shamed for you. Thanks be to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.